The latest financial scandal to hit our markets involves a commodities trading firm called Refco. The company's CEO is alleged to have hidden a $430 million loan to the company, somehow fooling the auditors, the regulators, the board of directors, and investors. What about all the mechanisms that were put in place after Enron to prevent this sort of thing? How did this happen? I'm Sarah Bartlett, and this is our topic today on USA Inc. Joining us today are Reva Atlas, a reporter for the New York Times who has written about Refco, and Bert Rothberg, an assistant professor of accounting at Baruch College, who also has spent 30 years as a commodities trader. Bert and Reva, thank you for joining us today. Let's start by just painting a little bit of a picture of Refco. Um, can you tell us, Bert, a little bit about the company and how it got into its current fix? Yeah, Refco is a rather old commodity brokerage. Uh, Back in the early 1990s, uh, they changed focus. Uh, they realized at the time that the commodity futures business was going to be consolidated, and they bought up all sorts of other commodity futures brokerages. It turned out to be a brilliant strategy, and they became one of the most important, maybe the most important uh, futures participant in the markets. They also branched out from brokerage into capital markets, by, by me, which I mean doing uh, deals, doing a derivatives contract with Merrill Lynch or doing a loan with uh, another bank or something like that. Those are not brokerage. Those are actually direct uh, deals that they do on a counterparty basis, as it's called. So they're one of the parties in the transaction. Exactly. And they take all the risk. And anyone who deals with them takes the risks of dealing with, it, with Revco. Um, they did very well. It was a privately held company for many years and uh, one that I personally had, had dealings with for many years. And, uh, you had, had an account there? You had, were... I had an account there and had nothing but praise for him. Uh, but um, they went public about uh, you know, a quarter ago or so. And shortly after that, uh, this irregularity was uh, discovered. Um, I might add that right now, uh, there is a kind of a mini boom or mini bubble going on in anything related to hedge funds, which Revco is, because Revco does a lot of brokerage and business with hedge funds. Um, many other stocks that have anything to do with hedge funds are going up. So I'm sure the owners of Revco felt this was a really good time to go public. So they went public. The stock went up 25% uh, on the first day of trading. Ten weeks later, we have the fourth largest bankruptcy uh, filing in the United States history. What happened? Well, it's, I mean, we've seen in, in, in the past, if you look at, uh, say, Drexel going way back now into the early 90s, any time you've got a, uh, a crisis of confidence with a financial services firm, um, assets, I mean, the, the business just evaporates seemingly overnight. So um, I think, you know, the jig was up the day this, practically the day this was discovered. Well, let's talk about what was discovered. Um, you wanna, one of you want to jump in and describe what the, the big surprise was? Why don't you take this? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, there was the, the discovery was that there was a um, a loan um, made. There was money going back and forth with the CEO Philip Bennett um, between him and the company, and um, um, a sort of a low-level auditor discovered this, and he repaid the loan, but you know, and, and immediately got removed um, as CEO of Refco. But again, that sort of people said, "Well, gee, how could this happen? Where are the financial controls?" and Really, seemingly, I mean, the um, the 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 buyout firm that uh, had taken control of Refco, Thomas H. Lee, tried to step in and, and, and sort of immediately show that they were, you know, do, taking the right steps. But, you know, just as I say, seemingly overnight, the company went bankrupt. So it's kind of like a run on the bank and exactly, an old-fashioned exactly. kind of crisis yes. of confidence. Yes. Now, why would this loan? The, can you tell us a little bit about the accounting issues that came up in that? Well. well I have no inside information, let me just start off with that, but from what I've read, uh, it was a somewhat complicated but not overly complicated transaction where I, whereby <coughs> the CEO Bennett had a, um, uh, another entity that he controlled, 
Uh, and the loan that was on Revco's books <clears throat> was sent over to that other entity. And then uh, just before the end of a quarter, uh, that, lo that loan wasn't really a loan. It was a receivable on a loan. The receivable was sent to a third party, which was a, uh, a hedge fund that did business with Revco uh, Liberty. Uh, and then after the quarter was over, the transaction was reversed, and the receivable came back to Revco. So the bottom line was that they were taking um, a debt that was owed to the company and removing it from the books of the company just for the period of the quarter ending? Is that? They were converting what was a receivable into a loan, into uh, a and loan. they were doing that you know, around quarter. the quarter every quarter. Yeah. And that's what got discovered? I, I think so, yeah. And that's what it, And it looks as if the CEO was very involved with this practice. Well, you know, there's going to be a, there is a criminal. Uh, uh, I think he's been indicted actually mm -hmm. on this, and so we'll see how we'll see how the trial turns out. But that's what it looks like to me. I mean. We have had the Sarbanes-Oxley legislation passed several years ago in the wake of Enron, and it was supposed mm -hmm. to fix exactly these kinds of problems. Why didn't that work this time? What happened? Who failed? Well, that is the big question, um, and a lot of fingers are being pointed um, at Thomas H. Lee, which is the um, buyout firm that had taken control of um, Refco and, of course, just recently um, having taken the company public. Um, so just back up for a second. Sure. They owned a part of, of Refco. They owned a controlling They were a majority mm -hmm. owner. Mm -hmm. Then they th were the ones who decided to take the company public? Well, it's, it, you know, I mean, as majority shareholder, yeah, you could, you could effectively say that. Essentially. Okay. Yes, yes. So they got some of their money out exactly. at the time of the IPO. Yeah, they got and half of it out. They were in charge of making sure that the books were okay when the, when the company did go public? Is, um, that, is that one of the issues? Well, one of the issues, um, yeah, I mean, there, there would be the underwriters, of course, as well. I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of p fingers pointed at Goldman Sachs um, and the other underwriters. So, I mean, the question is also, should, I mean, they didn't buy Rifco all that long ago. Should they have seen anything when they actually bought Rifco? I don't think fingers are being pointed at Tom Lee as much for the IPO as, you know, when they bought it, should they, because this was apparently this transaction, this receivable arrangement with Bennett was going on for a while. And what's their answer? Um, their answer is, you know, fraud is fraud. You know, they, they tick off, you know, the army of advisors um, that they hire, the accountants, the, the, the private investigators. Um, and they say, you know, we did all the right things and gosh darn it, you know, we got snookered. So, you know, and that's, that's the big question right now. I mean, you mentioned the hedge fund boom. I mean, there is a boom as returns in the stock market um, have been eroding. People have, um, in, in investors, and I guess really not sort of mom and pops, but, but pension funds, which of course have all our money ultimately, have been looking at other, other sources of return, and they've been giving their money to, you know, these buyout firms. They've been giving their money to hedge funds. And um, sometimes people, at the very least, get careless um, or, you know, I mean, there's, the, there's these, these vehicles seem to be um, vulnerable to periodic fraud. We saw the Bayou hedge fund collapse this summer, and mm -hmm. it was the same question there. I mean, should people have known? Bert, what's your take on this? Yeah, I, I just want to mention that it probably the most difficult thing for an auditor or an investigator of uh, a financial investigator to uncover is collusive behavior that includes top management. This goes way back. It goes back to the equity funding case in the 1960s, <coughs> which I actually remember. The, the, uh, in that case, top management all got together and colluded on something. Uh, and apparently something like that happened here. Uh, people at the top, probably including the CEO, uh, and some other people in operations um, um, did things. And it's very difficult for uh, an auditor or uh, an underwriter in the process of due diligence or even a government agency to uncover this sort of thing unless they make a mistake or something happens. And, and in this case, something did happen, namely a, a junior, uh, as, as I understand it, a junior mm -hmm. person on the accounting staff right. was looking at this and said, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense, and, and reported it to the board. And the board apparently didn't know about it either. The thing that is so surprising is that when you listen to that, is that an auditor missed something, but a junior person who right. I believe had only worked at the company about two months noticed it. Right. Uh, is the auditor really not responsible here? Uh, well, there, there are going to be civil suits right left the center, and I'm sure Grant Thornton, the auditor, is going to get sued a lot. However, <clears throat> there is a standard set of procedures that are, should be used to audit financial services firms, and Grant Thornton <coughs> excuse me, says they, they followed them. Uh, <clears throat> remember the 
the uh, transaction here, Grant Thornton was only uh, was was paid to audit the financial statements of Revco Inc. And so that's what they saw. Which is the parent? Which was the parent company. Mm -hmm. They were not auditing the financial statements of Liberty Capital. Uh, and what they did is, when they saw this uh, transaction with Liberty Capital, they called up Liberty Capital and verified that it was, in fact, an actual transaction. And once they'd done that, they've done their audit. So it's very difficult. It would have been very difficult for them to caught it, to catch it. There is a type of auditing known as forensic auditing, uh, used by investigators, law enforcement offices, all, and things like that, in which they actually put all these transactions into a data bank, do statistical analysis, and try to look for patterns that don't add up and things like that. But that's not routinely done as, as part of financial audits uh, in many cases. And <clears throat> so, you know, whether they'll actually be legally responsible, we'll, we'll just have to see. And what so. about the regulators? The SEC? I mean, where were they? Um, well, I mean, you, you mean, would you argue that they should have caught is that is it reasonable for investors to think that the SEC is going to protect them from something like this? It, it's mm. not against this kind of fraud. Uh, <clears throat> I'm afraid that um, the idea of personal responsibility, trust, and, and character still matter, uh, especially at the top. Uh, in accounting, we call it tone at the top, which is what it, what it sounds like. Uh, if you're going to invest your money, I would caution people uh, out there in TV land to invest in companies where you think top management has strong character and a good sense of honesty. Because if they want to steal, it's going to be really tough to catch them. We'll be right back. The Zicklin School of Business at Baruch College of the City University of New York is the largest and most diverse accredited business school in the United States, offering high quality, full-time and part-time degree programs at the undergraduate master's and Ph.D. levels. For information about the Zicklin School of Business, please visit our website, zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. That's zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. Welcome back. I'm speaking with New York Times reporter Reva Atlas and Baruch College professor Bert Rothberg. Who loses here in REFCO? Who's going to get hurt by this? Well, the, um, the equity holders in REFCO get hurt. Uh, because their stock has pretty much gone to zero. From 28 to zero. To zero. Mm -hmm. So they lose everything. Uh, the bondholders are going to lose a fair bit, although apparently uh, the market is telling you that there's enough money left in Revco to pay uh, 50 or maybe 60 cents on the dollar to the bonds, so they'll lose something. Uh, some of Revco's customers will probably be in trouble. Uh, I was personally a customer of the Fruit Futures brokerage, which is put in a segregated account and is untouchable, so I'm, I, I work You're out okay. I'm okay, yeah. <laughs> but uh, those people who did uh, capital markets business with Revco, who dealt with Revco on a one-to-one, -one, a counterparty basis, uh, they could be in, in some trouble because when a company goes bankrupt, it is allowed to uh, undo contracts, and uh, a financial instrument contract is a contract, and they, they can just be welched on it. Yeah. Can we speculate at all about Philip Bennett and how he does with this? Do you have any thoughts? I don't. I guess um, you, you um, think that the executives could be liable, right, given uh, the precedent we've seen with WorldCom and Bernie Ebers. Um, certainly, we could uh, see, see them going after today. Mr. Bennett. Sure. Uh, he, he's already been indicted on criminal charges. And what I really hope happens is just editorializing. A lot of people took money out of Revco during the IPO not just companies, but individuals, people. And I think those people should have to give that money back. And, he, and um, uh, certainly the top management, I believe, took out almost a billion dollars, or maybe even a little right. bit more than a billion dollars. Well, there's an issue that could come into play of, of fraudulent conveyance when um, the IPO was relatively soon prior to the bankruptcy. So will they go after all the money that people took out um, in recent months? A billion dollars would certainly go a long way to helping oh, some yeah. of the customers. I mean, there's a bet on I mean, this is, I wouldn't tell anybody out there to go out and buy Revco stock, but there are some people I've spoken to who sort of do highly speculative investing, and they're thinking that given the precedent we've seen with WorldCom, that there's going to be a, a, a decent-sized claim to some of that money that the stockholders will have. How about so. Thomas Lee, the buyout firm? Will they suffer? Uh, they clearly have already suffered in terms of their reputation. Um, and but yeah, they were they still will, equity holders, were yes, they not? Yes, they were still equity holders. Um, interestingly, I mean, the, the, the boom that's gone on um, it, um, for in, in buyout lands, I mean, they've taken Warner Music and some other companies public. They've sold some things off at a nice profit. So their investors are still showing 
um, a 30% profit on their portfolio overall, even with Rifco, assuming Rifco um, is, is in fact worth zero. So it's, what'll be interesting to see is, I mean, having covered buyouts for a few years, is that you know, every once in a while, one of these things blows up and people jump up and down. And then um, as long as sort of the returns recover, you know, people's memories are short. So I'll be interesting to see what, what the tale is on this one. It's fascinating that you could have a company that owns 38% of a company that goes bankrupt, mm -hmm. and its investors can still go away feeling like, well, we did okay. We had 30% returns, and so uh, it's as if there's no accountability. Is their reputation yeah. not it, harmed? That's the beauty of diversified portfolio. Yeah. yeah. Well, the problem right now is that people, you know, people don't know where to put their money. So these pension funds, you know, who usually take several years to decide what they're going to do in the first place. They pull their money out of Thomas Lee and then they say, okay, well, where do I put it? Do I put it in hedge funds? You know, there's a low risk investment for <laughs> you. So that's, that's the problem. Um, when you look at this, do you feel like it's a failure of regulation at all? Do you think that um, there should have been more regulatory involvement with this organization? I, I don't. I, I really think this was something that any, it would have been very difficult for a regulator to catch. Uh, it was very it was very difficult for anyone to catch. I'm sure all the people who did audit or uh, examine uh, Revco in any way are kicking themselves for not catching it. And, and these are people who did pretty significant due diligence. I mean, I'm I'm sure Goldman Sachs has a stack of work papers, you know, that'll fill a room on on what they did. Certainly, uh, the Lee uh, Equity Firm not only had uh, did audits, but they actually had their people on the floor there. Uh, but if this was a transaction that was just in a guy's head, you know, it's tough to find. Well, but so. we go back to this conundrum that there was a very junior person in the controller's right. office who said, well, this doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Why is this large interest payment keep coming in right at the end of each quarter? If he could catch it, why is it not reasonable to think that Goldman Sachs and well, Thomas it, Lee should have? You know, I think in the future you're going to see a lot more forensic type accounting like that and, and a good... Uh, pattern recognition type of approach might have caught something like this. Mm -hmm. And why would that not be in place already, given that we've been through the Enrons and the WorldComs and the Tycos? And I mean, wh why is forensic accounting something that is still not done on a regular basis? Well, it is done to a certain extent. Um, you know, a, an auditor is working for a company, so it really auditor really doesn't want to treat his customer as a criminal. Uh, but that, that's no excuse. Uh, I think these kinds of techniques are known about, and, and you'll see a lot more of them in the future. Is it, is it that the management of the companies aren't willing to pay for it? Would it significantly increase audit fees? I don't think it's that. I mean, I do think, as I say, that, that, that people's memories are short, and there's a sort of collective attitude out there that, um, you know, you sort of do the best you can, but if you miss this one, then, well, you get the next one. Um, so I sort of wonder unconsciously if, you know, if in fact people could do more. So that we could basically have the fourth largest bankruptcy in the country and everybody just kind of goes along and says, mm -hmm. well, as long as I get in on the next act, I don't really care. Is that yeah, the bottom I, line? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's the so. bottom line. And I actually, I think that's a legitimate way to look at things. The, uh, whenever you go into business, you, you have lots of risks. And if you're aware of the risk and you plan for the risk and you take the potential risk into account, if something goes bad, well, that's the way it goes. But in the meantime, three or four things go very well and, you know, you've done very well. Uh, and when you're taking high-risk investments such as hedge funds or private equity or emerging market debt or, you know, all this kind of stuff, you have to account for ahead of the time for the fact that uh, it is high risk and things like this can happen. And um, you know, that's life. It's, uh, what can individual investors do to protect themselves? I mean, you were talking earlier about um, the character of top management and having, having people that you can trust in. But if you're an individual investor, how could you possibly know? Uh, if you're an individual investor, you certainly cannot know the top man personally the top management uh, of a company you invest in. On the other hand, you can do some your own dil due diligence by before you, before you buy a stock, look at the biographies of the top management, try to find whatever press clip, clippings you can get on them, and that sort of thing. And, and probably more important, since most people invest via intermediaries, intermediaries like mutual funds or pension funds, you can look at the mutual fund and the pension fund, or the pension fund, and see if it's the kind of fund that's 
providing the right kind of services, if it has any, had any ethical lapses in the past, uh, all these sorts of things. Uh, I might add that the commodity futures business always had a somewhat seedy reputation in the whole financial services industry. I mean, I've been part of it for many years, so. Uh, but, You're but allowed it, to say um, that. So I'm allowed to say <laughs> it. It, it. It's true. And among many people in the white shoe financial services firms, I think Revco always had a bit of a taint right. to them. Uh, and and as well. uh, personally, I knew the people there, and, and I thought they were fine people, but, you know, other people disagreed with me. Right, I, would, I, I was going to make the point that um, Revco did have somewhat of a taint, and I guess the, the question I think that will endure in the minds of some investors, perhaps some of Tom Lee's investors, some of them voiced this to me, is, you know, are there certain kinds of companies that um, shouldn't attract that kind of capital, that kind of high leverage, high debt capital? Um, you know, I mean, is, is a buyout of a business as unstable as a, um, a brokerage business, is that the best target for this sort of investment? Um, so I think, I think those questions will certainly linger. The, the other thing that's puzzling to me is that, if I'm not mistaken, the auditors did um, have serious concerns about the accounting procedures of REFCO, and mm -hmm. in fact, those were disclosed in the documents yes, at the time that, of the IPO. And uh, so they, they did say that we found two significant deficiencies in this company's accounting procedures, and I believe they highlighted that one of them was they, they didn't feel comfortable with the way they were closing their books. Mm -hmm. So it isn't as if investors weren't warned, mm -hmm. and yep. it isn't as if the underwriters didn't know about this. Right. So why would underwriters go forward with an IPO of a company that has significant deficiencies in its accounting? You know, this is a hot industry, uh, and it's there was just a lot of money to be made. Look, the stock went up 25% the first day or something like that. Yeah. So, and uh, Thomas H. Lee is a huge, huge moneymaker for Wall Street. So because the names associated with this company were solid, mm -hmm. and uh, because it was in a hot industry, the fact that its own auditors were waving a red flag to investors meant that no one was really discouraged by any of this. It's yeah, it's, it sounds, you know, to a lot of people, it, it sounds <laughs> crazy, but, you know, as I say, if it had worked out, everyone would have been a genius, you know, and, and many times it does work out. Mm -hmm. Do you view this as an aberration, or do you view this as part of the financial system and something that is just going to periodically pop up from time to time? Um, I, I think I do view it as something that will pop up from time to time, but... We seem to have had a spate of these, <laughs> so you wonder <laughs> if uh, it's just there's a greater outcry right now, perhaps, when one of these things does happen. Um, we seem to have had a big clump. It, it seems so, that the clump we've had all have one thing in common is they're the product of bubbles. And I think what happens is that when stocks go up for a long period of time, everybody's making money. And so things sort of get, who cares, you know, we're all making money. And uh, I remember back in the late 90s when the stocks were, were rising, uh, fraud was uncovered at uh, some broker's office. Uh, and everyone was thinking of suing, but it turned out all his clients made money. Even after the fraud, they made money. So there wasn't really anything mm -hmm. to sue. <laughs> uh, and that's what happened. But then when things turned down, of course, it happened. So you know, beware of ethical lapses during bubble times. That's, um, and on that note, we'll say goodbye to you both. We've been very fortunate to have New York Times reporter Reva Atlas and Baruch College professor Bert Rothberg as our guests today. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Some people think of New York as the world's second home. The City University of New York, with students coming from 90 countries and speaking more than 155 languages, is the world's first university. Find us on the web at cuny.edu or call us at 1-800-CUNY-YES. The easy lesson to draw from REFCO is that if a CEO wants to plunder a company, he or she can get away with it, at least for a while. But it's more complicated than that. There were red flags in REFCO's case, but they were ignored by people who chose instead to take short-term profits and look the other way. Thomas Lee, a private equity firm, wanted to cash out of its majority stake in REFCO by selling shares to the public. Its underwriters, including the prestigious Goldman Sachs, were only too happy to help. 
No one seems to have been concerned that the auditors warned publicly of significant deficiencies in REFCO's accounting procedures. Investors don't seem to have cared much either. REFCO's shares rose 25% on their first day of trading in the public markets. Now, they're worthless. The moral of the story for investors is, do your own homework. You can't rely on big-name Wall Street firms to protect you. The fees they earn as facilitators seem to outweigh any risks to their reputations from ignoring red flags. For USA Inc., I'm Sarah Bartlett.